Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Thank you to all the sponsors of our Women at Health series, including Deloitte, Teladoc, and Opto. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joined us from Teladoc, Mala Murthy. Hello, and thank you all for joining us for today's important panel discussion on empowering female leadership in healthcare with proven success strategies. My name is Mala Murthy. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for Teladoc Health. Today, we are going to explore proven approaches for career and life successes. I will serve as your moderator and as a participant in the discussion. Our panelists today are two of our former winners of the She Powers Health Award. So let me take a moment to tell you about these awards. The She Powers Health Awards by Teladoc Health shine a light on diversity and inclusion initiatives across the health industry that addresses the disparity of women in executive board positions. This award highlights people who empower women to become leaders, are transforming and innovating in the healthcare space, and spark inspiration for the next generation of women leaders in healthcare. We are thrilled to have our rising star winners from both 2019 and 2020 with us today as panelists. Please join me in welcoming Chelsea Perry and Dr. Sejo Pathy. Hi there, thanks Mala. Um, and thank you to the team at Teladoc, at Health, at Optum and Deloitte for the incredible opportunity to be a part of this event today. My name is Chelsea Perry and I'm currently based in the Washington DC area where I work for an organization called DaVita Kidney Care on their home-based therapies and modalities and the expansion of those services in the Washington DC metro area. I am also the co-founder of a talent development program called Appcelerator, where we work to help underrepresented minorities and women in healthcare break into careers in health technology, in biotech, in strategy and operations, and consulting, um, many sectors of healthcare in which we're underrepresented. Um, and so I'm really incredibly grateful to be a part of this opportunity today. I won the She Powers Health Award back in 2019, and it's such a pleasure to get to meet the 2020 winner and spend some time with you, Mala. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and now let me turn it over to Dr. Sejal Hathi to introduce herself. Thank you so much, Mala, for, for having me. And Chelsea, likewise, it's a delight to meet the 2019 winner and to partake in this uh, fantastic community of people all striving and mobilizing to make healthcare a better place for women leaders to grow and learn and share with each other. So hello everyone. Um, my name is, as mentioned, is Dr. Sejal Hathi. I am an attending physician and a member of the faculty at Johns Hopkins, um, specifically their School of Public Health, and I'm in their health policy and management department. Um, I uh, went to Stanford uh, for my medical and business school degrees, Yale for my undergrad, and I just finished my training in internal medicine and primary care at Mass General Hospital in Boston. I run a podcast called Civic Rx, which uh, fosters conversations with key leaders across the globe about how we can reimagine our society to be healthier, more just, more equitable in the wake of this COVID-19 pandemic. And in just a few weeks, I'll actually be uh, moving to DC to join the administration as a public health advisor in the White House. So that's a little bit about me. That's awesome. So um, as Chelsea mentioned, you both are winners uh, of the She Powers Health Award, right? Chelsea, you in 2019 and Sejal, you in 2020. Um, so first, let me say a little bit about the awards and then we will go into our panel discussion just for context. Um, the She Powers Health Awards by Teladoc Health um, shines a light on diversity and inclusion initiatives across the health industry um, that addresses the disparity of women in executive board positions. This award highlights people such as you who 
empower women to become leaders are transforming um, and innovating in the healthcare space and spark inspiration to the next generation of women and women leaders in healthcare. So um, you both are poster children, poster women for um, what a lot of the future generations of women leaders in this industry and in this space would hope to accomplish. So as such, let me start out um, by asking a question around um, declaring your ambition. Um, you know, this is something that um, I heard of first, I would say maybe about four years ago. Uh, I was at a um, women's leadership event uh, in my prior company and um, a very senior woman came on stage and she said something that quite candidly for all the many years I've worked across many different industries, no one had ever said those words. And it was, um, have you ever declared your ambition? And in, you know, it, for all those years that I had been in leadership roles, I stepped back, reflected and realized that I actually had never said, declared my ambition. I kind of sort of knew what it was in the back of my mind. I obviously had worked towards it, but it's not something that I had ever voiced aloud um, to any of my mentors, my leaders, my advocates, my sponsors. So um, Chelsea, let's start with you. Um, and my question to really uh, to you is, have you declared your ambition? Have you thought about declaring your ambition? And give us your experiences if you have, how have you gone about it? Absolutely, thanks for the question, Mala. And I'll tell you, it's something that I've had to get comfortable with doing over time, especially as a, as a person of color in a corporate industry and as, as a millennial woman in, health, in healthcare, quite frankly. I think oftentimes as young professionals and women in the workforce, we get a lot of cautionary advice or tales about um, you know, being careful to make our intentions known and our ambitions, especially if they're high in nature. Um, and then just millennials and journals get a lot of flack for not understanding meritocracy and, and um, understanding what it takes to get to where you want to go and the work that must go in, especially in staunchly traditional fields. And so as I started to recognize some of my guy friends ascend higher in their careers and declare their intentions um, and other colleagues in the industry, I recognized that, you know, no one was coming to save me. And so if there was something that I wanted to do, I had to raise my hand for it. Um, and so along the way in different uh, roles that I've had in a leadership development program that I was in at Kaiser Permanente, I recognized and started to work with my mentors and my colleagues um, on learning how to negotiate salary, on learning how to work with difficult labor unions and hire my first person and fire my per first person and ultimately start to work to getting closer to the dollar and how money is help made in healthcare and how decisions are made based on that. And so I recognize that in order to get the experiences that I had the aptitude for and had the curiosity about, I had to just start to raise my hand. Um, and when I think about you know, a time where I wish I had have done that sooner, I think about when I was emerging from that leadership development program and was sort of charting the course and the next steps for my careers. And I, and I started to have interest in entrepreneurship and digital health and getting off the sort of beaten path in terms of healthcare delivered in the four walls. But I, I had made a lot of investment in school in terms of you know, the path that I was on and all of my mentors had backgrounds in certain areas. And so I kind of danced around what my intention was and my aspiration. And I mean, ultimately I found my way back to the types of work that I wanna do in the industry. But I think that I could have avoided such a long path um, to getting to where I wanted to be if I had have declared my intentions earlier, my ambitions earlier, so that I could get the resources, the support, and the mentorship that I needed to, um, to get here a little bit more quickly. Sejal, what about you? Yeah, so it's a really good question. I, I would say that I probably have declared my aspirations or divulged my aspirations early on too much even maybe to a fault. I, I do have the philosophy, and this is something that my, my parents imparted to me long ago, that if you don't, the, the entire world, you know, it's that 
famous refrain from Paulo Coelho's book, The Alchemist, if you want something, you truly want something deeply, intently, the entire world will conspire to help you achieve it. And the only way that others can help you is if you articulate what it is that you desire, what it is that you're dreaming of. And of course, the, the challenge there is, is being able to understand and recognize what it is you hope to achieve. And I, I think that that is an evolving question and something that even today I struggle at times to identify. There are so many challenges to address and I am only one person. And so figuring out where I might focus my energies is has been the most challenging question of all. But I've I've learned that in, in sharing my values and my interests and the challenges that interest me with my mentors and, and well-wishers and supporters, they can help me identify where best to focus my attention. Even so, to get to the, your question, one time that I felt I was perhaps too hesitant, even insecure about articulating this, sharing this with others, was at the start of my medical residency training at Mass General a few years ago. Because as you know, even though medical professions, physicians are increasingly engaged in policy and entrepreneurship and so-called medicine plus fields, it still is relatively uncommon. And yet I knew three years ago, four years ago, that I envisioned myself addressing um, these issues as a, at a systemic level. Uh, and so I came into residency and, and you know, all the faculty and advisors were asking me, so what is it that you want to specialize in? Which clinical fellowship do you want to do after this? What research are you anticipating? And internally, I was like, I don't want to do any of that. And yet, I feel that is the expectation within this community. And I think one of the questions inherent in, in, in this struggle is just how do you have the courage and the wherewithal to define yourself as apart from a field if that's what's required, as uh, to, to break out of the mold, to do something that's potentially unconventional. In order to achieve that, you need to one, know what you want, and two, you know, muster the the, the, the courage, the bravery to articulate that despite what society's expectations may be of you, be it because you're a young, a woman a, a, of color, or simply harboring interests different from the field you've nominally chosen. Fascinating. And, you know, what's so interesting is I think we three of us have um, different paths to where we are at this point in time. But you know, as you both were talking, uh, I was nodding my head because um, I have faced, you know, in a very corporate career, very similar sets of challenges, right? Mentorship being absolutely critical. And, you know, what's interesting to me is I, I learned over the course of time, there is a difference between a mentor, a sponsor, and an advocate. Like they are all different. And you need actually all three of them, uh, and they can be um, ma male or female. It, uh, you know, they're they're both helpful in different ways, um, but but you need them. And I would say, Sejal, as you were talking about, you know, I love what you said about values because at the end of the day, um, through all of the uh, plethora of choices that you will have to make or we will have to make. I think what has to ground us is the values, right? Like that is what will make it authentic to us, the choices we make. Um, what, um, what would you say, as you have both thought about your choices and your paths, um, you know, it's very clear to me, um, you both have demonstrated a track record of tremendous initiative. Uh, and, I know that initiative comes from um, a sense of empowerment, right? It is, um, I know that it has uh, guided you, influenced you, shaped your paths. And my question is, um, Sejal, let's start with you first. Um, where did you get that sense of empowerment from? Was it a place? Was it a person? Was it a set of circumstances, maybe even challenges that you overcame? What gave you that sense of empowerment? 
Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. And I would be remiss if I didn't first thank my parents and highlight the tremendous privilege I have because of the struggle and the grit and the commitment that they have invested in my growth and my health and in my career. I would be nowhere without my parents. And I, you know, this is a maybe common sentiment among immigrants and immigrant families, but my parents sacrificed everything to ensure that I had what they didn't. And I will be forever indebted and grateful to them for that. I think beyond my immediate family, my sense of empowerment flows from my struggles actually as a teenager with anorexia nervosa. So I was diagnosed with this disease when I was 15 years of age. And I come from a family for whom a culture for which speaking of such psychosocial ailments, letting letting alone and and conceding that a member of the family has one is utterly taboo. And so for the longest period of time, I struggled invisibly. I refused to acknowledge that I had a problem, let alone do anything about it. And ultimately, it was my physicians from the endocrinologist to the pediatrician, OB-GYN, psychiatrist that convinced me that I could surmount this disease, that I was more than this, that I had the agency to overcome it. And during the course of these experiences, I also met other young women who particularly who had been buffeted by depression, insecurity, self-doubt, eating disorders like bulimia and anorexia. And they really pushed me to get through it. They, they gave me the community, the sense of family that I needed to recognize that I was not alone. Um, and that I was beautiful and valuable for my inherent characteristics, no matter how many pounds it was that I weighed. And so I I, I owe it to them. And and one girl in particular, her name was Rena. She told me, Sajel, you know, if there's an entire community, a sisterhood of, of women who are rooting for you, who only want to see you soar, it's almost impossible to fail. And that sense of community that I had, my physicians, my counselors, the other young women, they became the fountainhead of my courage. They're, they propelled me to keep reaching, to keep striving, to, to crawl out of this abyss that I had landed myself in. And to this day, everything that I do at the center of it is this sense of community, is this desire, this ambition to build coalitions. Because I truly believe that if we work in concert with other people, with shared values, we can do anything we set our minds to. Wow, that is that is a powerful uh, story. And thank you for sharing it and being so candid about it. Um, Chelsea, what about you? Thanks, Marla. And thanks, Sajel, for the bravery and telling your story in, in front of uh, this audience. And I'm sure other really grateful audiences that get to listen to you speak. Um, I agree with you. I think that Parents are our early mentors, our early role models. And when I think about my sense of empowerment and where it comes from, it definitely comes from those two trailblazers that I was born to. And so uh, they're both Air Force vets, uh, grew up in the Jim Crow South and the military was their way out of a really um, dire situation, both economically, both education wise. Um, And so just observing them uh, navigate their careers and hearing from them often, you know, to who much is given, much is required. I think I always knew that I would be a leader in some facet. I, you know, I can't do push-ups any, any better than probably some of the folks that are listening here. I'm a decent runner, but there was, you know, there was never an expectation from my parents that I would go serve our country or be in the military, but what there was that expectation that I would you know, forge my own path and make sure that those that were coming behind me on that path didn't have the struggle or navigate the same barriers that I did um, because of the work that I did to empower empower them and give them access to the things that I didn't. And so when I think about my sense of empowerment there, it comes from that. But when I also think about just sort of my own frustration with inactivity and observing things around me that I think that can be improved. And I know that, you know, I have I can have some sort of impact, whether it be small, whether it be large, whether um, I can profit off of it or someone else. 
I think that sort of empowers me to, to step forward and figure out how I can make a material difference in some regard. And so when I think about my work with AppCelerator, I think about you know this not being the first organization to help tackle diversity and inclusion in the healthcare space. And no, we were not born out of you know the tragedy with George Floyd. Um, but I, I saw myself as someone that, you know, a little bit frustrated with the things that I was seeing around me um, and thought that, you know, I can help make a material difference in some way, uh, whether big or small. And again, going back to that to whom, who much is given, much is required. Like I can make it so that folks coming behind me don't necessarily struggle to find mentors or sponsors or access to how to get my resume to look the way it needed to, to be to be competitive um, in a certain space and can do that for other individuals. And so that uh, those sorts of influences like my parents and like that frustration with an activity, I think is what empowers me to, to um, make change in my industry. You both are um, such incredible role models. Um, you know, in my case, I would say very similar to the themes I've heard. You know, I come from a very middle-class family in India. I'm a first generation immigrant to this country. Um, and I would say, you know, my early empowerment really came from my mom. You know, she um, didn't finish school. She didn't finish grade school. Uh, she was, um, you know, essentially in a role as a young teenager taking care of a number of siblings. Um, and so, you know, right from, I don't know, my first conscious memory, I can remember um, how fiercely she wanted me to excel. And she truly believed, and I would say lived the fact that there are absolutely no barriers for anything that I would hope to achieve. And I do carry that with me um, all the time, right? So I would say that is probably my first sort of um, provider of uh, empowerment. I'd also say after I came here post-grad school, um, I think what has over time empowered me, frankly, is failures. I, I think what they say that they are the best lessons. Um, I think I've had successes. I've also had crashing failures and they have taught me and taught me hard and taught me well, and they have empowered me um, to, to learn how not to make those mistakes again, empowered me to stand my ground, empowered me to have a point of view, um, to speak my point of view, um, to speak up for myself. Um, so I would say it's both my family as well as the experiences that I have gone through um, that truly really have given me a sense of empowerment. Um, you know, the other curiosity I had uh, as I was listening to both of you is, um, Chelsea, how would you describe yourself uh, as a leader? Like, what is your leadership style? And um, did you sort of come by it on your own, evolve it over time? You know, did you have a role model in mind who you adopted it from? Um, talk a little bit, please, about your leadership style. And I would say, especially when you think about um, what you would want to impart to the next generation of women leaders. Absolutely. Um, when I think about my leadership, leadership style, I think about really being one of servant leadership. I think I, I do a lot um, in my career to empower others, as you know, we've talked about being a theme of this conversation today. And that means a lot to me because of the servant leaders that I've you know, been fortunate to be mentored by in my career, just had the privilege of viewing them on their journeys. Um, but I think about how like my leadership style has had to evolve over my career too. I think coming into my career in healthcare, I've wanted to assert a lot of control over the things that I work on, over the products that I deliver, um, over, over the sorts of relationships that I have in the workplace. And as I grow in my career, understand and recognize that sometimes there's different pieces uh, that we have to let go to other people and that we have to entrust others with, especially if we want to be a servant leader and help them grow in their careers too, uh, and, and sort of empower them in that way. So I think that is one of the ways that my leadership style has evolved over the years. And when I think about people that have influenced me in terms of leadership, 
I think about one Beyonce. I mean, you don't have to watch the Coachella documentary to see her out there doing something different with her talent. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, God gives us gifts or talent. Um, but I think a piece of that talent has to be combined with hustle. And so that's what I learned from Beyonce. And I learned that, you know, you have twins and then you become vegan and you do an awesome tour and you kill it. And you're the first black woman to headline Coachella or you spend hours at, you know, improving your craft. Um, and so those are leadership lessons that I learned from her. But when I think about, you know, sort of the, the leaders that I admire in healthcare and, and one particular being the late Bernard Tyson, I think about, you know, an importance of um, thinking about the future of the industry differently thinking about health equity and the social determinants of health before it's trendy, um, before we really understand like the financial impact of what we as organizations have to gain um, from it and leading an organization um, in the way that he did before his untimely passing, I think are some of the nuggets that I take away in terms of how I can, I'll continue to craft my leadership style and the things that are important to me um, going forward in my career. And so that's what I would impart to the young leaders listening to this webinar today is, you know, do what's not popular before it's popular, um, but also hustle hard with those talents, those God-given talents that you've been given. Well put. Sejal, we only have a few minutes, so let me have you um, uh, chime in in terms of your leadership style. How do you think about inspiring the next generation? So I'll be I'll be brief, but I absolutely agree with Chelsea that servant leadership is the style that I hope that I espouse and certainly to which I aspire. It's a model of leadership that I've seen actually embodied by role by um, role models such as uh, Secretary mm -hmm. Mandy Cohen of uh, North Carolina, who is a mentor and a former boss to me, uh, to even various faculty at, at Mass um, General who always put the community needs first and uh, make sure that all voices are represented at the table in formulating both treatment plans and, and hospital policies. So uh, I strive to be someone who stays close to the ground, who is anchored in the lived experiences of those that I purport to represent and to serve, and, and in turn, um, to ensure that I am putting forth a plan informed by the diversity of experiences um, on, on my team and in my organization. You know, what's so fascinating is if someone were to ask me, and I had not heard the two of you, what would be my leadership style? Um, I'd say it's servant leadership. So how interesting it is that all three of us uh, have servant leadership as sort of our leadership style. And I think for me, you know, servant leadership is really about um, a few things, right? One, it is uh, about flexing my style to differently to each one of the people who I work with, because you know, they all listen differently, process differently. So there is that aspect. Um, another aspect I would say of my leadership style is around, um, you know, it's the, it's the, there are moments that matter um, a lot. Um, and it is like, I'll give you, you know, one example. Um, one of the finest leaders I've worked with, no slouch in terms of his bar, the standards he expected, et cetera. Um, but you know, what I remember the most about him is how he gave me the space um, to get away for two weeks when my mom passed. And it's that that meant so much to me that I, I was willing to, you know, walk to the end of the world because of what he did in that moment. So I would say, in my view, part of servant leadership is really being there in those very critical moments for your people, um, because that's how you will win their hearts and minds. Um, so I wanted to thank you both. Uh, I know we are starting to get questions, uh, and I'm excited to see what questions we have in store from our audience, but um, thank you for um, your sage thoughts. Uh, you both are so incredibly inspiring uh, with 
in your collective experiences and I've learned a lot from the 30 minutes. Um, so let me um, let me look, uh, turn it over to uh, the questions. Um, so one of the questions is, um, what recommendations do you have about finding a strong mentor? Um, and how important is it for this person to have a similar background, i.e. gender, lived experience? Um, Chelsea, you want to start? Sure, I can, I can start. I think probably one of the most unpopular advice that I'll give here about finding a mentor is don't necessarily look up, look around you. Um, I think that there is a really incredible creator, actor, writer that I follow um, quite closely, Issa Rae. She created the series Insecure and started her career on YouTube making videos. And she always talks about the importance of looking around you for the people that you're gonna team up with on a particular entrepreneurial venture or idea that you have to impact your community and those people sort of becoming your mentors of sorts and learning so much information by networking laterally and always focusing on, you know, which executive am I going to cozy up to? Um, and so that's one of the sort of unpopular advices that I'll give you about mentorship here on this call is to consider that as an opportunity and to think about um, filling your sort of mentorship or the, that board of advisors around you with people that have skill sets that complement yours but are not necessarily your same skill sets. And so to your question about how important is it to find someone that's in the same industry as me, probably important. They're gonna help and coach you on navigating the, the particular industry that you're in, but it's also important that in that board of advisors or in your mentorship um, sort of deck of cards that you have some folks that are outside of the industry that can help you think about ways to innovate in the space that you're in or how to think differently about the finances or the business model of the department that you're running. And so I would encourage you to, you know, if you are in the healthcare industry, find some folks that are going where you wanna go and, you know, get, get in front of them, meet them, you know, find that person that can be a sponsor someday for you, but also to look outside of your industry and consider some folks that have some different skills than you to sort of complement the tools and the, um, the, the skills that you bring to the table. Say, Jill, what about you? So I want to affirm, again, everything Chelsea wisely shared. I will add that I think the distinction Mala drew earlier between a sponsor and a mentor is salient here in that there will be people in your orbit who might offer you advice who can help you problem solve on specific challenges. And then there will be people who can lift you up to carry you with them as they propel forward in their career or who can nominate you, name you, appoint you, select you, refer you to positions that may be of interest to you. And those are sponsors. Uh, and so it's important to accumulate, to, to foster relationships with both styles of um, advisors, if you will, of, of supporters. And I, in this vein, have a board of advisors of my own. I perhaps uh, clumsily, when I was very young, so when I was starting college, actually called it a board of advisors and created a Google listserv and invited everyone onto shared phone calls and meetings and recognized quickly like that, that. <laughs> that um, as much as I appreciated that sense of organization, yeah. um, it it was it became a little too formal or formulaic for some of my advisors. And so now, although I maintain that cadre of people in, internally in my head, um, I don't have such regular formal meetings, but even so, I feel grateful that I have assembled a group of friends, advisors, mentors, and sponsors across all domains within healthcare and without, because I do know that what I want to do touches on you know, everything from economic agency to healthcare access to public health to social entrepreneurship um, and financial mobility as well. And so I think that having people from diverse perspectives enriches the work that you do. And I, I want to therefore uh, echo what, what Chelsea said earlier. And don't be afraid to reach out cold to folks. Um, many people that are um, now close friends of mine, I shot a cold email to, and it obviously has to be targeted 
and you have to have a real reason for wanting to speak to them, not simply that they're maybe a star in their own field, like there, there needs to be a real reason for why you're seeking that conversation and what you hope to gain for it as well as contribute. Um, but don't be afraid to, to reach out, reach out because um, fewer people than you might think actually muster the boldness to, to do that. And so you'd be surprised how often you get a reply. Great. Um, there were a couple of questions that I will combine together around the theme of gender bias. Um, and, you know, the questions really are centered around um, how did you address gender bias and what can we do um, to essentially evolve from that and make the experience of being a woman, a woman, the question is about women in medicine, but I'd say all of us in the, you know, have different paths. Um, you know, how do we make the experience better, not just for us, but again, for the next generation of women, right? Like, um, how do we make this a better experience for them? So um, thoughts on, Seja, let me start with you. Um, gender bias, tips, tools on how you have uh, essentially uh, combated that. Yeah, so I think that that's an excellent question, and I'm I'm heartened that there is growing focus and attention on this issue. I might hearken back to a point I made earlier, which is the importance of coalition and community. And I found that in every workplace that I've joined, it is the other women around me that make a difference um, for me. There was an article published actually in the New York Times. I want to say probably at the tail end of the Obama administration that discussed how women at the White House who were present in a meeting, if they noticed that a woman had posed a question that was maybe dismissed or ignored, a man repeated yes. that question, they would say, oh, yes, well, as Jane Doe yes. was saying a moment ago, I agree yes. about this important. So yes. finding ways really to center the women around you, to build them up, actively recognizing that the yeah. only way you will move forward is by building up the other people and particularly the other women around you. That is a philosophy that I've tried to take to heart and um, that I've had open conversations with. And I'll give you a very, I guess, tangible example. So um, it would be no surprise to you that, uh, especially as female trainees were often mistaken for, for nurses or vis-a-vis -vis the nurses within the hospital, um, our word carries less currency than the same word of our male colleague. And when I have been in the ICU, in the cardiac ICU, and it's in its eye, another, another woman um, and a man, all residents on call, and a nurse comes to me and asks me, this has actually happened, what would you do for patient X? I say one thing, she maybe disagrees with that. She takes the same question to not few feet you know, next to me, my male colleague, um, and, and poses that. Both he, I remember this very clearly one instance in particular, both he and my female colleague said, well, actually, Dr. Hathi just, just yeah. answered that question and, and we would agree with her here. And so finding ways again yeah. to uplift and yeah. amplify the voices of the other women around you has, yeah. been, has been key and I think is important. Interesting, Chelsea, your experiences, tips? Yes, yes, yes. Sejal, I think about that example that President Obama gives a lot when he's speaking. And I also think, you know, for the ladies on the call, just be very cognizant of positioning um, when you're thinking about meetings that you're going to and you're in your head like nervous about where you're going to sit, recognize your male colleagues are not, they're going to sit at the table, they're not going to sit yeah. at the chairs placed around the table. And so start to be thinking and keeping a critical eye out about um, implicit biases versus, you know, the explicit biases, which are pretty easy to spot, especially in some of those examples that Sejal gave. But think about implicit bias in terms of gender pay equity. Think about, are you talking about how to negotiate or are you talking about the salaries that your counterparts, your male counterparts are earning, um, but you're just too nervous to really talk about money or to talk about salary in the same way that we know others do so that they can have the power in the negotiation. And so I spent a lot of time in the App Accelerator program and with mentees outside of the program talking about some of those implicit biases too um, in the way that you know those sort of explicit ones are, are very easy to spot. 
that's that's interesting. You know, it's a really good question. And I would say from my own experiences, um, no question, right? We have faced gender bias. Um, and I, I'd say a few things. This is just my, my the, the way I have chosen to handle it. I would say the first is, um, I just have tremendous confidence in the work I do, right? Like to me, that is the bedrock of um, my confidence. Um, and I say that from the start because that is what actually allows me to combat what I would perceive as gender bias. Um, I'd say the second is I don't let it get under my skin, right? Um, the third is, you know, I'm really careful um, in, in a way not to do it to myself. Like I'll give you, a, this is a very silly example, but I didn't even realize I was doing it till one of my women, senior women um, mentors in American Express, where I used to work, actually told me this. She said, when you come late into a meeting, Mala, why do you always, you know, sit at the edge of the room? Like if you were a guy and you were late to a meeting, you would still come right into the meeting and sit at the table. Like, why do you sit at the, and I was like, that's true, I actually do that. And so part of it is to not do it to ourselves. Um, and I say this because we do it, I think sometimes unconsciously. And I've learned over time to be a little bit more careful in how I project myself, frankly. Um, and then the last thing I would say is, you know, as a CFO, I am in a lot of meetings where to the point I think say Joel you may, you know, questions will be asked and they will be addressed to the male, the men in the room. And it's like, hello, I'm here. Um, and, and you know, the way I do it is when they ask the question and they will specifically mention the name of the man in the room, I will answer the question, right? Like it is my way of saying uh, I'm on equal footing. So these are small things, uh, I, I agree, but I think it's these everyday things that I've now conditioned myself um, to just do, just so that again, to me, it is, um, we just have to keep putting our foot forward and saying, we are present, we are here, we are good, and we are on equal footing. Um, okay, let's uh, address a handful. Of, we'll only have time probably for one more question. Um, um, what is your most memorable or most recent mistake that you've made in your career? What did you learn? And what tools, resources did you use to be resilient through that experience? Chelsea? Ooh, what a loaded question, a tough question. Um, and ladies, gents. Actually, we only have, I'm going to give you 30 seconds and then Sage, I'll give you 30. Sure. Speed round. Sure. When I think about a recent mistake that I've made in my career, it's just going back to that point uh, earlier about declaring intentions. I was in a performance uh, review with my one up manager and then from there, her manager about, you know, my direction in the company, where I wanted to go, the types of projects that I wanted to see. And I didn't talk about what I really wanted, right? Um, I think that a uh, mistake that I won't probably repeat in the near future or ever is that not declaring your intentions and sort of dancing around the sorts of things that you want to do so that you don't block your blessing or block your opportunity to grow uh, where you are now. So that's mine. What about you, Sajel? So I, in a similar vein, I think one of the mistakes that I've made is I've been invited to give various talks, um, to even write a book. And I've been afraid of, I think I, I struggle with imposter syndrome. And so I've declined actually quite a number of these opportunities from even simple panel engagements to delivering a commencement address at, at my alma mater um, to even you know a book offer that I was granted because I couldn't conceive of why anyone would want to hear from me. And in retrospect, and in talking with some of my supporters and my fierce advocates that are my parents, I have been, you know, shaken, like, how could you possibly think that if you don't trust in the value of your own word, 
then how can you possibly succeed into the future? And so just recognizing that, you know, you are, you have an incredible amount. I have an incredible amount to offer and just trying to remember that and carry that with me in, in whatever that I pursue. Well, this has been an absolutely incredible 45 minutes. Thank you both for sharing your very, very valuable time. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you all in the audience for listening in, for asking questions and for engaging. Um, I will now turn it back over to the health team. Thank you. The She Powers Health Awards by Teladoc Health shine a light on diversity and inclusion initiatives across the health industry that address the disparity of women in executive board positions. This award highlights people who empower women to become leaders, are transforming and innovating in the healthcare space, and spark inspiration for the next generation of women leaders in healthcare. The She Powers Health recognizes individuals who are making a significant impact on people's health, empowering women, and modeling diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Nominations can be made at teledochealth.com slash shepowershealth and will be opening through September 3rd, 2021. The She Powers Health Award Ceremony at Health 2021 in Boston from October 17th to the 20th. Thank you for coming and we hope you have a nice day.